Hello and welcome back to the Thinking Jew podcast. In today's episode, we discuss the case of Brittany Maynard, who in 2014, after being diagnosed with terminal cancer, moved to Oregon, which at that time was one of only four states that legalized physician-assisted suicide. Nowadays, it's actually 10 states as well as Washington, D.C. In the beginning of November 2014, she ended her life under her own terms. In this class, we look at the Torah's approach regarding physician-assisted suicide, as well as suicide in general, to the classic sources of the written and oral law. Okay, so our topic tonight is physician-assisted suicide. This was inspired, I guess, by uh, the famous case a month ago, Brittany Maynard, who I, I, I couldn't find out the answer to this, but I'm, I'm, I think she's Jewish, and they were telling me what's crazy. Her name is Brittany Maynard, but her mother's name is Deborah Ziegler. <laughs> Uh, and her father uh, is uh, no, she, 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 she grew, she grew up as a, she, <laughs> she grew up, she grew up in a, in a single mom home. She didn't have a father. I'm not sure exactly what the story was. I didn't find it anywhere. But her, her mother's name is Deborah Ziegler, and that just sounds very Jewish. So, Brittany Maynard does not sound very Jewish, but her mother has a very, I don't know. I couldn't find it online. I kept trying to Google it. I found one blog that suggested a hypothesis of her being Jewish as well. But it didn't mean literally nothing. But it wouldn't, it wouldn't shock me. I mean, it, it could be. I couldn't do any more research on that. But whether or not it was, I guess that just makes the question even more real to us in terms of the halachic ramifications of it. In terms of, you know, is there, is there any, uh, what's the Jewish opinion, I guess, on assisting suicide? Well, let's start with the beginning. Suicide in the first place. What's, is there ever a situation where one is allowed to kill themselves? We obviously know we've learned in the past the verse says, V'chai b'hem, and you should live by them. The main thing is the Torah wants us to live, right? But at the same time, the Torah is very sensitive to pain and to difficulty and to realness of life, right? So the question is, is there ever a situation that would allow someone to commit suicide? And if that situation is, if there's, if there's no situation, or whenever the answer to the question is no, what would be the, whole, the, the legal status of someone who, what would be the legal status of someone who Assisted someone in doing something that's prohibited, right? So, so Masada and there's really two. Is, there's two parts to that question. So Masada is. So Masada would be another example of that, right? We'll get into that. Is, is, we'll get into that, that as a as a because they committed. Okay. Right. That that'll all come come back out into this, right? So so that's really that's really the two parts of the question, right? Definitely the detail. The the default view is despite the fact that Torah is sensitive to the pain, you're never allowed to kill yourself. It's actually a great a great quote there. Shimon Shmuel Hirsch said, who was he was a famous German leader of the Jews. Um, mid, uh, he was born in like early 1800s, died late 1800s, and he fought strongly against the, the Haskal Enlightenment and the conservative movement that was trying to veer off of you know, traditional Judaism. And he said that the difference between um, a secular, if it's between, he said, he said in, a, in a democracy, the people make the law. In Judaism, the law makes the people. Right? Mm-hmm. And if you think about it, that you know what's carried us throughout all the generations of exile and everything we've done in life is really the continuous learning of Torah has really what's made the people and developed us to the point that you know here we are in 2014 in exile for a long time and we're still here getting together to learn the laws of suicide right and that really is so in the end of the day despite the fact that there is tremendous pain and Torah is sensitive to that if the Torah were to tell us that you have that there's some reason why you have to be experiencing this pain and the answer isn't to just relieve yourself of it. We would have to, that day, you know, take ourselves and say, okay, that, the Torah makes the people, right? Like, this is, the, this is the, the view. So, so that's really the question. We'll break it up into two parts. Um, the first part is, is there ever a situation of permitted suicide? Of permitted suicide? Is there ever permitted? I don't get a handshake. What's up with that? I got a handshake. <laughs> What's going on? Nothing. Okay, so before we start, I want to read you just, this is the famous article. Brittany Maynard wrote this article, posted it on CNN um, a few days before she killed herself. Let's read a few lines from it to start off. Brittany Maynard killed herself from, from uh, she had a, four, what was it called again? I forgot the name of it. A GBM, a Right, exactly. And um, she moved from California to Oregon, one of the four states that legalized um, yeah, she, she's like suicide. She's 29. And... Um, she says like this in the article, In April I learned that not only had my tumor come back, but it was more aggressive. Doctors gave me a prognosis of six months to live. Because my tumor is so large, doctors prescribed full brain radiation. I read about the side effects. The hair on my scalp would have, be, would have been singed off. My scalp would be left covered with first-degree burns. My quality of life as I knew it would be gone. Not true. 
we're just telling you what she said. After months of research, my family and I reached a heartbreaking conclusion. There's no treatment that would save my life. And the recommended treatment would have destroyed the time I had left. Skip a little bit. I quickly decided that death with dignity was the best option for me and my family. We had to uproot from California to Oregon, because Oregon is, o- is one of only five states, which I believe is four states, where death with dignity is authorized. I've had the medication for weeks. I am not suicidal. If I were, I would have consumed that medication long ago. I do not want to die, but I am dying, and I would like to die on my own terms. I would not tell anyone else, and here's the main paragraph, I would not tell anyone else that he or she should choose death with dignity. My question is, who has the right to tell me that I don't deserve this choice? That I deserve to suffer for weeks or months in tremendous amounts of physical and emotional pain? Why should anyone have the right to make that choice for me? Right, and that was her... This is her, uh, you know, for her big social media outburst, and she publicized her death, and before she killed herself. And that was her question, right? So the question is, to put it back into, into our terms, two parts, is suicide ever permitted under any circumstances? Sure, for Arabs. Well, so we'll get there, right? <laughs> Jihad is a very Jewish concept. And, uh, and, is it, and if, it's not, if, if it's not permitted, if it's prohibited, is it, what's the status of someone assisting a prohibited action? And we'll get into this through... Uh, various stories that we'll find in the Prophets and Gemara, and we'll go through a bunch of stories, historical analysis. So um, the, I guess the first point to start is, before we understand the concept of taking away life, going toward death to relieve yourself of pain, is to first properly gain what is life. Right? To understand the concept of getting rid of it, we have to understand what life is. So there's a Gemara, Talmud states in Erevin, 13b, an ancient um, dispute between the famous house of Hillel and the house of Shammai. And they had the following dispute. Is it better that man was created, or better for man have not have to not been created? They came up with the idea that it was better not to be created. So there it goes. Yeah, they disputed this for many years. In the end, they, they, the Gemara says they counted up the opinions and they determined it's better for man have to never have ne- better for man to have never been created. However, now that we're here, you should look into your actions and improve yourself as much as you can. That was their conclusion, and the Gemara provides no direct explanation as to why it was better for man to have not been created. The the, the explanation that most people, the most common simple explanation is, is that life is the fusion of body and soul, right? It's the fusion of the spiritual and the physical. And we enter into this world for a purpose. God wants us here, which is why he places us here. As Jews, we believe in God, we believe in there's a purpose to life. And he puts us here and connects the soul and the body for a reason. Now this world, in a spiritual sense, is a dangerous place to be. You're surrounded by temptation and desires and you don't see God and it's, it's inherently a dangerous place. So, the simple understanding of the Gemara is, it's better for man to have never been put into the situation mm-hmm. where he has to live with these struggles because of the difficulty of it. Which if that's what it's saying, in essence what it's really saying is, is life is not merely just a gift from God to just you know, go eat, drink, and be merry. Rather, there's a responsibility to life, and God put us here for a mission. Right? We're, so to speak, the Bailey of God, that he gave us our body for a certain amount of time, for a certain purpose, and there's a reason for that. So with that, that's kind of the purpose of life. So now if we're going to go take our own initiative to, you know, to, to change that, so then that could be problematic. Let's just bring this out. There's a famous um, halachic authority called the Red Vaz, or David Ibn Zimri, 1500s. He wrote a commentary on Maimonides, and he, brought this, he, he, he illustrated this in a beautiful example. There's a, there's a concept in Jewish law that I guess somewhat comparable to the Fifth Amendment, but not really. The Fifth Amendment says that you're not obligated or you have the right to not testify about yourself. Right? In Jewish law, it's stronger than that. In Jewish law, you're not, al- you're not believed to talk about yourself. Let's say, for example, you walk into the Jewish courts and you say, I had an immoral sexual relationship with a married woman. They don't, they don't hear the word you're saying. They don't believe you. They don't trust you. Even though that's officially a punishable crime, they won't punish you because you don't have a believability to say things like that about yourself. Why not? Because there's a law that I'm not, I don't have a believability to say something about someone that is close to me. Just like I can't testify about my brother, my sister, my mother, any of your direct relatives you can't testify about. Why? Because you have a vested interest in them, your family. Whether it's for good or for bad, you're, you're viewed as being a non-objective opinion. And just like you're considered close to your family members, you're also considered close to yourself. Therefore, you have no believability to walk into Bayesden, to walk into the courts and say that, you know, I did something wrong and then get punished because of it. We go so far with this, there's a fascinating case that Gemara talks about, is that let's say I walk into the courts and I say that, well, not me, obviously, let's say Joe walks into the courts and says he had an immoral sexual relationship with uh, Rachel, right? Now, we can't believe him about himself. 
because he has no believability about himself because we believe he may have a vested interest in himself. So we ignore him about himself, but the Gemara calls it Palginan Dibure, which means we split his words. And we hear the words, we do not hear the words that he committed a sexual crime, but we do hear the words that Rachel slept with someone. So we can actually attach him with another witness, because you always need two witnesses, to punish Rachel for committing adultery. She is a married woman. But we will not believe him about himself because he has no believability to talk about himself. Right? And that is a principle in Jewish law. A person has no believability about themselves. However, asks their advice, or David ibn Zimri, asks the following question. It says, if I, if I walk into courts regarding a financial matter, and I say, I owe you $10 billion, right? even if it's a mass sum of money that's very significant, I'm believed to say that. Even though, if I were testifying about my brother, I have no believability to, right? If I testify about my brother, whether it's corporal, capital, or financial, I'm not allowed to say anything about a relative. But within myself, I'm not believed for corporal or capital punishment, but I can say, I can talk about my money. I can say, I owe you $100, and if I then say, oh, I changed my mind, you don't really know that I just said it, the court said, look, your word is real when you say it in the courts. We're going to come down to your property, and we're going to collect $100. So the Radvaz asks the question, he says, how do you view a person regarding himself? Either do you trust him to be an objective opinion, in which case he should be believed just like he's believed by his money, he should also be believed by himself, by corporal and capital. Or do we say that he's not trustworthy, he has vested interest in himself, so then why do you believe him about his money? And now this Radvaz bring, sets up here a major, major principle for medical ethics, and you'll find the quote in a lot of different places. He says as follows. He says that when it comes to your money, it's in your jurisdiction. And you can do whatever you want with your money. If you want to take your money and throw it away, if you want to take a hundred dollar bill and light it on fire, we call that baltashka. It's a waste of money, and it's not a, the Torah doesn't approve of wasting money. The Torah doesn't recommend doing that. It's illegal according to American law. It's illegal to burn. Let's say you want to take your, your, your uh, fancy vase and smash it on the floor, right? It's not illegal according to American law, but it's not recommended in Judaism. It's, it's frowned upon because you're wasting. But there's not, you're allowed to do that. If you say you want to throw away money, you could say that. But if you say you want to throw away your body, Says the advice, your body is not in your jurisdiction. Your body is not yours to decide you want to give yourself capital punishment. Your body is not in your jurisdiction to say you want based in the courts to give you lashes because you committed a crime. You don't have the believability to say that about yourself because it's not in your jurisdiction. That's the starting point. That's, that's the starting point. The principle. We find this principle, again, probably the most famous medical, medical piece of Talmud. What's the most famous medical piece of Talmud? The famous story of the tragic death of Hanina bin Tradion. Right, the ten martyrs. Rabbi Hanina ben Trajan, there were ten martyrs, the Roman Empire decided that they're going to take ten great Jewish leaders because the ten brothers sold Joseph, and they're going to kill them with the most brutal, horrible, terrible deaths. And one of these ten martyrs was Rabbi Hanina ben Trajan. The story is brought in the Gemara of um, Avodah Zarah, 18a, and 18b, sorry. And, uh, and, the, and the story says they captured him while saying a Torah discourse. They took him, they took an actual Torah scroll, they unrolled it, they wrapped him in this Torah scroll, they took wet sponges of wool, and they put it between his heart and the, wool, and the scroll in order to you know, distant, make, it make it longer, for, make the suffering more intense and make it last longer. And you can imagine the sight. His, his students were around him, the Gemara said they were asking various questions. You know, they were, all, they were, they were with their, their teacher to the last second. And they asked him a bunch of different questions about stuff. At the end of the questions, they said, Rebbe, my teacher, you're, you're, you're suffering in so much pain. You're, 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 why don't you just open your mouth, inhale the flames, let it burn your insides, and you'll die faster. Well, just, just do it, because you're, you're, you're dying anyway. Just open your mouth and let your, let, let your insides get burned out, so you'll be done. And he said probably the most famous Jewish medical ethic line quoted, said, it's better that the one who gave me my life should take my life, and I shouldn't kill myself. Right? That was his response. He said, God gave me my life. I would like to let God choose when my life will leave, and I don't want to put my opinion in there and add that into the middle and choose when my life's going to be taken. And Rabbi Feinstein and a lot of others bring this as an additional source. However, not everybody is that strong that they can do that. Right. That's nice in theory. It's right. right. So we're going to get this in a second. We're going to come to the story of... To the general population. So there's two ways. There are, there's a minority view that understands the story that that's not the law, but rather that was an act of extreme piousness. The general accepted rule is that that is the law. That's the most important that you don't have a right, even if you're in pain, to take your life. However, we'll see, we'll see in a second, we'll get to the story of King Saul, which is where the first suicide directly talked about in, in the Torah, um, where, where we'll see a distinction between 
what, between doing something, you know, like achila a priori, or doing something in an ex post facto situation. I mean, the Torah definitely understands, like, for example, there's a famous law of Maimonides. There's three rules that you have to give it, three laws you have to give up your life for, rather than get killed. Right? Uh, three cardinal sins, right? Murder, adultery, and idolatry. Now, let's say somebody says, I don't, I, I can't, I can't, I'm gonna, I'm gonna do the, I'm gonna do the Samak. They don't have the capacity to, they don't have that inner strength to do what God told them to do at the time. So the Rambam says we don't look down at them at all. They're not held accountable for the sin they did. Because God understands the difficulty of the situation. Not only that, it's very hard to punish the person who committed suicide. Well, we'll get to that in a second. But that's not necessarily hard if you believe in reward and punishment after this world. Meaning, no, no, but I mean for us. To for, for us too, right. But, but in that situation, let's say, was, let's say he committed adultery rather than getting killed. He said, either, either sleep with this woman or we're going to kill you. So, a married woman. So the law is, that's one of the three cardinal sins you have to give up your life for. Let's this person couldn't do it. So he slept with her. And let's say we have even witnesses testifying, and we have video cameras, and we have everything going on, and it's a capital punishment. We should kill him now. So that Maimonides rules that since he did it out of tremendous duress, the Torah understands the psychology of man. It was an impossible situation. So even though he did the wrong thing, and we don't, we don't, you know, we don't condone his actions, however, we understand that what happened to him, we're not going to punish him for it. Right? So even within suicide, it's the same type of thing. The fact that we understand how people would do that, doesn't necessarily mean that it's the a priori appropriate greatest thing to do, but we, but we respect that it happened that they did it. There's a difference in that. Well, another example of that is Masada, right? Right. That that would be that would be another thing that that'll, that'll become example. right. Exactly. That that's what all it'll all come off of the different explanations see, of. We don't see Masada as they're going against. One hundred percent. Right. They were all war heroes. They were and seen very positively. Right. Yeah. Well, 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 we're going to find these stories and kind of have to figure out. So if that was positive, so maybe Brittany Maynard was also going to die and she was going to suffer through a lot of difficult migraines and seizures and different things that happen with this type of disease. So maybe, you know, she was also a war hero because she suffered, she, she avoided that punishment. So we have to figure out where to draw the line. So right now, what I'm building up is that definitely the, the default position and the general background position is that the Torah says, let God, who gave you your life and gave you your body as a, as a guardian, be the one who takes it. Now we'll have to see all these situations. Well, what, are, what we find people do do it. So how does that work out? We're going to have to figure that out now. The, pr- the problem with her is just by her very speech, she's defying Jewish law. You know, I'm going to lose my hair. It is going to be such. There's no 100 percent proof of that. And even if you lose your hair, it's people can live without hair. Right. 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 Yeah. Well, she. 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 Her. She was straight up saying that. It's not worth me living my life. I don't have the same quality of life that I have right now. That was really her. That I don't have right now. Not that that's, I, that's true for. I mean, everybody can say that. A lot of people get that part of the. In terms, I mean, I was I wasn't planning to get into this tonight, but in terms of the slippery slope logic that all right. the right. non-Jewish that's, secularists that's talk about, problem. that's that's the scary part of that. Right. That's one hundred percent true. So the the question really is, what's what's the source of of this law? Do we have a do we have a basis? Where where in the Torah does it talk about this? Can we have we, a story from. Can, can I just ask a please. quick question? So. Somebody who commits suicide, burying them in the Jewish city. Oh, so right. So we're, we're, we're going to come up to all these things. Okay. If you, if you, if we, I'm talking, we'll get, we'll get everywhere here. Okay. I'm going to cover all these things. So here, I just printed out, we have enough here. This is just a verse in Bereshith. Small crowd, so we can go through it together. This is the source of suicide, of the prohibition of suicide in the Torah. It's chapter 9, verse 5 in Genesis. <laughs> and we'll just read the English together. And you point out to me that a lot, there's a lot of extraneous words in this verse, and each word is we derive different things from. The verse, and sure, now the background of this verse is is that Noah and his family were all just coming off the ark, and before Noah there was a prohibition to kill animals, eat it, right? Noah was not allowed to slaughter animals and eat them. Not Noah, but Abraham, not him. Adam, and all those until Noah were not allowed to kill animals, eat them. God, when Noah came off the ark, allowed him now for the first time, which you see in. Um, and uh, where is it? It's right over here. One of these verses also. That um, in verse three, every moving thing that liveth shall be for food for you. That was the novelty. God now allowed him for the first time to slaughter animals and eat them. And God now puts a restriction on this in verse five. He said, "I'm allowing you now to kill things for the first time. I'm giving you permission to take <laughs> another living being and destroy that life for your own self. Be careful." Verse five, and surely your blood, meaning human blood. Of your lives will I require. I'm going to demand for you if you kill a human. Don't think because I'm allowing you to kill animals, you can now go kill humans. At the hand of every beast will I require it. And at the hand of man, even at the hand of every man's brother, will I require the life of man. And there's a lot of verboseness in this verse. And 
we see clearly, though, what the, the context is, God is saying, even though I'm allowing you to kill animals, you are not allowed to kill man. Now, with all these extra words in the verse, the rabbis teach us different things from them. Right? So already in the first word of the verse, and surely your blood of your life will I require, we already know it's forbidden to kill people. Right? You cannot kill another person. Now, says the Gemara, when the, Gemara, when the verse says two lines afterwards, and at the hand of man. What do you mean at the hand of man? That's referring to man killing man. We already said, if man kills man, that's prohibited. What's this and at the hand of man? Says, says the rabbis, that's referring to suicide. Not only killing another person, even killing yourself. And since this verse is being told to Noah, this is brought down as one of the seven Noahide laws. It's forbidden for a non-Jew to, in Jewish law, which one, it's included in murder of the seven Noahide laws, is for a non-Jew to commit suicide. Which in terms of assisting a suicide, assume that it's a prohibited action again, it would be equally prohibited to assist a suicide of a non-Jew, if it's forbidden for them, as it would be to assist a Jew who it's forbidden to. There'd be no difference in that. Because this verse is given to Noah here. And then the next part says, what does it mean when the verse goes, goes on and says, and even at the hand of every man's brother? What, what's the addition of even at the hand of every man's brother? So there's an... And sisters, it's okay. And parents. Right. So what, what does it mean? So there's a, there's a, great, a great rabbi called by uh, Yaakov Tzvi Mecklenburg. And he said, what does it mean that every man's brother? He says, this is referring to... This, he lived, I think, like two, three hundred years ago. So this is referring to... Um, Killing someone like your brother, why would you kill your brother? You love your brother? He said, killing somebody because they're suffering in pain and you view them, you view their killing them as a, basically, basically a mercy killing, as a euthanasia. So even in a situation where you're killing him like a brother, even in that situation, says the verse, will I require the life of man, right? Meaning the Torah here is explicitly saying, according to him, that, that even if you're doing this as a favor to the person because he wants you to, because he views it as a positive action for him because he's in pain, God is telling you you're not supposed to kill people. Murder is forbidden. That's how he learned this verse. This is really the source, this is really the source of, of um, suicide in the Torah. I find, a re- I find a really also interesting thing. There's a famous Mishnah in uh, Kiddushin 82a. I assume all the doctors know there's a famous Mishnah that says that the best of doctors go to hell. You know this Mishnah? But, uh, so, the, so the question is, the obvious yeah, question is, the obvious question is, there were great Jewish doctors that were at Maimonides, right? Maimonides was a great doctor. <laughs> there's, a, there's been a lot of great. So the question is, what, what does the mission mean when it says that? that if you, so there, so the, the simple explanation, the way Rash learns it is, a lot of doc, when doctors come to the point where they, they're playing God and they decide, they, they view themselves as they're, they're in control of everything. That, 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 that's, that's definitely one explanation. But I saw an awesome explanation that, the, that one of the comments, one of the... One of the he's showing him on the page say, and that's an awesome question. He says it's referring to doctors that kill their patients out of mercy killings. He says it straight up. He says it's explicitly referring to euthanasia. He says doctors. That, what is it? The best of doctors will go to hell. He says it's referring to doctors that are killing people doctors. and they view themselves as doing the right thing. But basically, it was a mission about Doctor Kavorkin. Exactly. But it happens all the time. We talked about you talked about it in the first class, like a morphine drip. Right. right, so there, there was a lot of... Yeah. That, that was Tim, Timothy Quill, right? There was a famous case of Tim, right after Dr. Kevorkian. You're allowed to give the patient the morphine drip. Oh, so we're, we're, we're going to get to morphine in a second also. The difference between treating pain and killing someone, you're allowed to take a lethal risk in treating pain. In Judaism, we'll get there, we'll get there shortly. But it has to be a lethal risk, not a lethal injection. Meaning, no. if you're going to definitively kill him with that injection, you're not allowed to. It's only... No, you, but, but, but if you tell the patient... But how do you define that? If you give them the morphine pain drip, and you can tell the patient, listen this up this way. Okay, we, we have to talk about this afterwards. We're going to get into this because I've been doing a lot of research the past three, four weeks on this topic and I wanted to speak to you about that. But let's, let's go through this. We'll build it up. We'll get there for, we'll get there shortly. Oh, thanks so much. So it's, so it's like this. So, so you should just, first of all, it's only the best of doctors that go to hell, mm-hmm. the Mishnah says. So as long as, you don't, as, long as you're not that good. As long as you're not, you know. I'm not that good. You're good. I'm not going anywhere. I'm not going anywhere. I'm safe. I'm safe. Okay, so the, the first story we find of suicide in the Torah is the famous story of King Saul. And there's a, there's a, it's an interesting story. This, this story is, is found at the end of Samuel 1 and in the beginning of Samuel 2. It kind of carries through because Samuel 1 was the kingdom of, of Saul, and Samuel 2 really starts the kingdom of David, which started with Saul's death. So it's kind of the transition is Saul dying and David taking over. So Saul basically um, was in a major battle against the Philistines. And he knew from prophecy that him and his sons were all going to die in a war. He didn't know which war it was. They were all going to die in a war. He was getting destroyed in this war. His sons were already killed in the war. He was on top of a mountain, and he was surrounded by his enemy. 
He goes to he's there with his, with his arms bare, and he tells his arms bare, um, "Please kill me. Take the sword. Take the sword and kill me." To kill the king, saying he's scared. He's not going to kill someone. He's a healthy person again, right? He wasn't. He was going to die from enemies, but he wasn't. We're not even talking yet about a terminal patient or anything like that. We're talking about a totally healthy person. I don't, I don't we'll, we'll get the, we'll get yeah, the transition. I don't know if I agree with that. Well, he was healthy at the time. He was in a risk. So so we'll, we'll get we'll, we'll, all these are the questions of how he did it. You're saying this, so? Because by the definition, I mean the whole thing that. I mean, to cut to the chase, I mean, the whole thing in Judaism with suicide and the reason you can bury a person who commits suicide. Wait, wait a we're, we're getting exactly the point. This is the answer to Saul. You're answering the question of Saul. Let's just build up the question and then we'll get to the answer. 100%. 100%. Just, just, he's always one step ahead over here, the doctor. You know, he's always one step ahead. But, um, so what happened to King Saul? So King Saul, two steps ahead. Wow. Don't so, consider yourself such a good doctor. Yeah, we no, can't. Uh, no. <laughs> no, now he considers himself. Uh, so he tells his arms bearer to kill him. The arms bearer refuses. He says, absolutely not, I'm not going to kill you. So it says, King Saul takes out his sword. He falls on his sword and he dies there. The arms bearer is depressed and he kills himself as well. That's what it says there. But now there's a problem with this because that's the end. That's the last chapter of Samuel 1. Go to the first chapter of Samuel 2. There's an Amalekite youth that comes to King David and tells King David that Saul died. So how do you know Saul died? And the Amalekite youth tells him, um, I saw him on top of a mountain on a sword and he was just about dead and he asked me to finish him off and I took a sword and I killed him and I finished him off and King David says he tears his he, he tears him out in the morning he says how dare you, you uh, kill the anointed one of God and he kills the youth on the spot so now there seems to be a contradiction between the end of Samuel 1 and the beginning of Samuel 2 because it clearly stated in the verse at the end of Samuel 1 that King Saul died by falling on the, on the thing and in the beginning of Samuel 2 the youth said that he killed him so now there's a dispute amongst the Rishonim as to which one is accurate. Not accurate, how to learn them both. <coughs> Mo- Moses, there's a minority, some people will understand that the youth actually was telling the truth. This is a minority opinion. Most say the youth was just lying. King Saul killed himself. The youth was trying to be proud and like tell King David how he helped out Saul. And that's how, some, that's how most people understand it because it's easier to justify how he lied than to explain what the verse means when it said Saul was dead. However, there is an opinion that says that when it said Saul died, it didn't mean he was actually dead yet. It means he was about to die. He was about to die and he killed himself. But he didn't actually, his life didn't actually fully leave him yet. And then the Amalekite came and actually hastened his death. Right? So if that is the accurate, if that, going with that viewpoint, then it's explicit the fact that King did... Well, the, to dispute. There's, I mean, there's two valid approaches. I don't know which one is historically correct. But there's a dispute amongst the on the in the Mikroski Dolos on what exactly happened. I have all this stuff here if you want to look at it afterwards. I have all the... Mama Cole's left hand quoting. But, um, so if you go with that, then David, King David killing this youth is basically an explicit, um, explicitly condemning euthanasia, right? I Meaning this youth basically what he did was he saw King Saul dying of pain. He hastened his death by killing him quicker. And King David said, don't do that because he did that. I'm killing you now. Right? So that would be... Well, that, that to me is a problem. What's a problem? Because why would he have the right to kill the guy for saying that? Yeah, you're saying because, right. Meaning that, you're, that question really is on... That question's really on the, on the opposite side. Meaning, let's go with the other viewpoint that says, in reality, what actually happened was this kid was lying. Right? And really, King Saul killed himself. If he was just trying to sound tough and said this story, then what was the right of King David to kill him? If that was actually... I mean, he should have at least had to know that. Which a lot of the... They all... They're bothered by this question, but it's, it's off the topic of suicide. So we'll keep it until afterwards if you want. But in either case, whether or not King Saul killed himself or not, he definitely at least tried to kill himself. Right? It was definitely an attempted suicide. Whether he finished himself off himself or the Amalekite youth finished him off, this is definitely the first incident of an attempted, although not totally by himself, suicide. Suicide is not the same thing as committing suicide. But the question is if we're going to assume King Saul was correct in doing so, so that means. In doing what? In killing himself. Even if he attempted suicide, he was. I mean, he obviously viewed it that the legal thing, appropriate legal thing to do, would be to, to commit suicide. Or not? Because you could say a lot of people attempt suicide because they smoke, because they gain too much weight. No, fine, fine, fine. So you know, King Saul, we're assuming King Saul was, a, was a, a righteous person who was anointed by God as the best leader of Israel. So we're assuming that the reason he did something had a legal basis for it. That, that's, what we're, that's what we're assuming. And we, and we need to just pull out what that reason is. That, that's really the question, right? So the question is, what was that reason? And the question gets a little bit bigger because, just to prove it, the, the Gemara says in Yavamas, this is in... Um, 78b, the Gemara says that there was a famine that went over the land of Israel because since they didn't properly eulogize King Saul, they were punished by a famine, which clearly implies that King Saul was, a, a was a correct in what he did. 
And just a little background information. The, the Code of Jewish Law states, this is in Yerodeah 345, someone who commits suicide is, does not get the general burial rights. He can't be buried in the regular Jewish cemetery. You're not supposed to mourn him. You don't have shiva. You don't have eulogies. It says you, you don't have the normal Jewish burial rights. The, the, it continues and says, however, if you did it out of forced, whatever that means, very vague, like King Saul, the, the, the word of the, of the Code of Jewish Law, then you have all the regular Jewish burial rights. So now the question is, what exactly was unique about King Saul? What exactly did he do that was different or that was allowed that we have to figure out? So there's a, there's a big dispute as to what, he, what exactly his, his reason was. Many, 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 many understand that what King Saul did was actually wrong. He was, he was not justified in killing himself. You were never allowed to a priori go ahead and kill yourself. However, ex post facto, like we were saying before, we totally understand the psychology of man, and we recognize that the duress and difficulty of the situation and the fear of torture and everything that's going on around you would cause you to get to the situation that you'd kill yourself. And therefore, ex post facto, you, you deserve and you're obligated to get all the regular burial rights. You're, bo- you're buried in the regular cemetery. You get shiva. You get eulogies. And, and, and because the Jewish nation didn't properly eulogize him, which they should have done, that's why the famine befell them. Now, this answer is extended by many modern-day poskim to say what causes most people nowadays to commit suicide. I'll be honest with you, I have, I'm, I'm now 29 years old, I've had in my lifetime two good friends that committed suicide. Oh, really? Wow. Yeah, I have two friends that committed suicide. Let's, let's um, here. No, I mean, there's the two, two points I was on. They're, they're crazy, crazy things. I don't remember the time, I'm just like nuts. But, um, Religious guys? Yeah, one of them I was in, one of them went to high school with, and she did that one. The other one was a guy in Arizona with us in Baltimore. All the, all the guys who know I was probably closer with them than they were, but <coughs> a friend of all of ours. And they, they, bo- they both had regular Jewish barrels and stuff. And um, nowadays, in most situations, most of the posts can speak out that the reason most people commit suicide nowadays is because of some psychiatric, psychological, there's some issue with them, the demons in their head, whatever you want to call it exactly, that forces them to feel like they have no answer to life and it puts them under a tremendous amount of dress and strain that it kind of forces them to do it. And we view that as being comparable, although that definitely is not an allowance to go ahead and commit suicide because you feel like this in, an, in the Chachila, right, a priori. But ex post facto, you definitely don't take away from a person like this any type of, of regular Jewish barrier rights. Right. And therefore there would... Oh. Which is going to... Because like, if you go to a cemetery, even in Dallas, you go to a Jewish cemetery, you'll see there's always an area one suicides? Grade, two grades over here. I don't know so, so, it's, so it's interesting because if you think about it, in a so case like it, there are exceptions. No, no but my question is, is this a new? No. Is this a new no. What I'm quoting to you now is, is, is not is not new. It's okay. old. Okay. The you question, that, have, the Shulchan Aruch himself already gives says that in, 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 in situations of, of extreme duress, there's, you get regular burial. There's two sets. There's nine percent people who commit suicide are considered ill. Uh-huh. Okay, they have a psychiatric history. They've been but, but let's say, for example, death with dignity, where you have a person like Brittany Maynard. She's not ill. She's not sick. In order to, to, to do death with dignity, you have to pass psych, psychological and psychiatric tests. You have, to prove there's, you have to prove psychiatric help. You have to request it twice across different states of different amounts of time. Her, her whole thing, I don't think, can be, can be seen as correct. Well, well, that's what I'm saying. Meaning, right. even right. nowadays, when we come across these types of things, that, it's normally... Can't see that. It's mm-hmm. right, no, that's what I'm pointing out. And now there's an irregular person who kills himself. Like you're saying, in most situations will say there was some ill symptom. However, like I'm pointing out, in a situation like a or in a situation like, like death with dignity, is not suicide. No, well, the it's really homicide. Well, but, but the last, that's the, f- the first. Because Janet Atkins was the first one he did when he went to that park over there. So she was. He had his machine there. She she turned it on. That was that, that's why he got off. And the first there was finally that case he publicized on the. On the news, they put it on whatever. In that case, he was convicted of homicide. But he did before than a dozen times of assisted suicide where the person basically killed himself. But he just set up on the scene this Mershatron that he set up to kill people with and they killed themselves. So that's the first approach. The first approach is that King Saul is actually wrong in doing it. But in an ex post facto situation, it's permitted, which will apply in a lot of cases nowadays. Another approach that they explain was that King Saul was feared that, feared that if he would be captured, there would be many Jews who said, oh, the king's captured now. we got to go save the king. And they're going to all try to save him, and they're going to all get killed trying to save him. And therefore, he did it to, to save the lives of many. Which is, again, a question. Are you allowed to give your life to save the lives of many? It's a kind of a, a whole class in and of itself. But that was another approach. That's, the, a, very, that's a very important argument. That, that, that definitely, uh, and that's a valid approach in, in law. And the third approach, which is going to apply a lot nowadays also, <laughs> is that 
he feared that if he would have stayed alive and been captured, they would have tortured him to the extent that he would have worshipped idolatry, which would have been desecration of God's name, and to avoid desecrating God's name, he killed himself. Now, throughout the generations of history, you'll find a lot of scholarship on this, because, for example, during the times of the Crusades, and the Holy Wars, and all the other times when the, the Christians and Muslims forced Jewish conversion... Right, exactly, right. All people were scared. They said, I know that if they're going to torture me unless I worship, worship their God, I'm going to end up worshiping their God because I'm not going to have the self-control to actually do it. But I can kill myself right now and then I won't be in that situation, right? This question came up a lot throughout history when they were constantly being oppressed and forced conversions and stuff. So there's a lot of Scots that takes from, and they, a lot of people understand, from King Saul's name. And there's, this is early in the kind of the Gemara being stories about there was a ship of 400 young boys and girls that were being assigned. This is like exactly like Boko Haram. This is like a ship of 400 boys and girls that were being taken off to be sold as sex slaves, basically. The Gemara says that they were Jewish people and they all, as a mass suicide, jumped off the boat and killed themselves to not be put into that wrong situation, right? And that all comes back from this understanding in King Saul's story that we're basically to, to save desecrating God's name you are allowed to kill yourself. So those are basically the three main well, things that come out of... The problem with that argument, that you're, then you're, you're saying that her argument is correct because you're saying that in order to avoid, to avoid suffering, you're so Not suffering, that's creating God's name. Not torture. Well, only, to, only, only because suffering, suffering will lead him to worshiping idols. I know, but that's, that's, that's not a first step. Because once you suffer, you're no longer... Of sound mind. That's the first argument. That, it's, that argument said, the first argument, that it's, you're not allowed to do because of suffering, but ex post facto we understand it. That, 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 that's only going to excuse an ex post facto situation. To initially go ahead and do it, the only reason for that would be is if you're going to first, um, if you're going to do it because that's the creation of God's name. It's not one that you allow you initially to do it. So there's three stories we find in the Gemara and the Medrash of, I guess, interesting ideas that just open up a little mind, and then we'll try to Say the, the law. There's a famous story the Medrash brings, and there's an old lady who said she can't taste life anymore. So she went to the rabbi named her Yossi Bar Khalafta, and she said, my life has no meaning, I'm bored, I'm old, she, was, she wasn't dying. So she said, what should I do? So he said, is there any mitzvah that you do that's like really dear to you? So she says, that's the woman, so I wake up every morning and I religiously attend chakra services. I'll never miss a prayer service in the morning. Even if I have an extremely important thing to do, I always go in the morning to, to synagogue. So Rabbi Yosef Bar-Khalaf said, you know what? For the next three days, don't go to synagogue in the morning. So she didn't go to synagogue in the morning for the next three days, and on the third day, she died. That's what it says in the, in the Medrash. Second story. There's a Gemara that talks about this in Sota 46, 46b. It tells the story of the elders of Luz. There's a city called Luz. The Gemara says that there was a special power the city had, that the angel of death was not able to enter the city. So everyone in the city just is kind of like a ancient Never Never Land. You know, just the difference was Never Never Land, you didn't get old. Here you got old, you just never died. Right? So, in the city of Luz, the angel of death had no control. So the Gemara says what happened, people got old, they just, they got sick of life, and when they got sick of life, they left the city, when they left the city, they died. That's what the Gemara says, somewhat of a form of suicide. A third story, the Gemara, this Gemara is in Ksuvis. There was a Rabbi Judah the Prince, he was one who, who basically put together the Mishnayas. So he was dying on his deathbed of a terrible stomach ailment. And his disciples and students basically gathered in his house, and they were learning and praying for him in his house, kind of as a special measure to, to keep him alive. And his maidservant, who was viewed as being a spiritual person, saw that he, he needs to die. He, he's in tremendous pain. He, he shouldn't be alive anymore. And she realized the only reason he's alive is because he has this like spiritual respirator there that was like all of his students kind of learning and praying for him that like his soul couldn't leave him because they were all there. So she says a prayer that let the heavens overtake the, the, the lower people, let the higher people take away the lower people, that he, he should be able to die. Then she takes some vessel, something, some vase, she smashes it on the floor, everyone looks up for a second, they stop, and he dies. That's the story in the, in the Gemara. So in these three stories, we find that there seems to be certain situations... <coughs> Again, the lady stopped going to the synagogue because she died. The elders left the city, so they died. And, uh, and this maidservant who... Uh, King David title. King David. Oh, King David's another story. Right? Sure. King David was, wouldn't stop learning. He was learning himself. Yeah, yeah, yeah. He said, as long as I'm learning Torah, the, the angel of death can't get me. And the angel of death made a sound outside. He went to look outside and he tripped. He was walking down the steps and the angel made, um, made him trip on the steps. And he tripped and he stopped thinking for a second and then he killed him also, right? So, but, but there he didn't intentionally stop. No, it wasn't intentional there. There he was, dis- I mean, he was distracted and he lost it. 
in these three situations, somebody is setting up the death of other people. He told them not to go to the synagogue anymore. So these are the three situations people seem to bring uh, approval. We see that in certain situations, it seems to be that you're allowed to. But the, the rabbis all explain these, these situations as being unique because in these three situations, there was some type of metaphysical impediment that didn't allow them to die. Either there was some unique spiritual power to lose that the others has never died, or she had a special merit of praying that didn't allow her to die, or his students learning that didn't let him to die. But all the rabbis told them in these situations was put yourself back into a natural state, and once you're in a natural state, you'll die from being in the natural state. I mean, we, we don't find in these stories, which this, you'll find this happens in a lot of the stories that come across in, in the Gemara, the reason, when, when they told them to, to, when they allowed them to die, they just allowed them to go back to a natural life. And once they entered into natural life, they lost this merit and this special reason why they're allowed to be alive. They therefore naturally then died. So that wouldn't necessarily be comparable to going ahead and taking life. Now, just going to finish up quickly. So the, until now we've said, try not to go too over, until now we've only been talking about healthy people. We haven't mentioned a word about a patient or a terminal person or a... Uh, sick person. This is all healthy people. So now, what happens with um, sick people? Is there any difference if someone's sick? So let's start with the, let's start with the opposite extreme. There's a unique case in the Torah called the Gosses. I guess the best English term would that be the, um, someone who's like in the. It's not just that they're terminal, but they're in the process of dying, moribund maybe, or someone who's literally at the brink. The, go, the rabbis understand that he's like 97 percent going to die in the next three days. He's already. They describe he's coughing up phlegm, and he has certain. It, complete deterioration of health. So this person, there's a unique law about a ghost ace, and that law is you're not allowed to touch a ghost ace. I'm sorry, what, what's a ghost? A ghost is a, is a moribund person, a person who's in the okay, process of dying. More, okay. But like, not, ter- but not way past terminal. He's dead, but he's just about there. Right. Okay. So, the law is, is the Gemara compares him to a candle that's finished all the gasoline that is burning. It has the last, smallest amount left that if you put any movement near it, it'll flicker and you'll, you'll extinguish it. So too this person is at the brink of death. If you even move this person, you put your hand near him at all, it'll cause his soul to depart, which would be hastening his death. Therefore, you're not allowed to touch a ghost face. That is the law. Says, so maybe that was what we were talking about when he said he killed him with the sword. He was but, you're not, but you're not allowed to touch him. So he was wrong. He did. So, yeah, okay, right, that, that's one of the opinions. One opinion was that he was about to die, and he actually killed him. The problem is the other verse says he was dead. It's a contradiction. You have to well, figure yeah, it out. That, that he was going to die. He's just about dead. Right, you have to look at the Hebrew words there. I'll, I'll show you afterwards. That. It's a hard to reconcile, but just the Hebrew words. So the Ramah makes a, a major leniency here, though. The Ramah, the Ramah, Code of Jewish Law, says like this. He says, Although you're not allowed to hasten the death of a moribund person, you're allowed to remove an impediment of his dying. Right? You're not allowed to actively hasten his death, but you're allowed to remove something that's impeding his death. What, what is, what's his example? His example is quoting from a book called the Sefer Chassidim. It says, a person dying and his soul's trying to leave his body, and there's a person chopping wood outside his building. And this person, the chopping noise, for some reason, doesn't allow the soul to leave the body. So I don't have no scientific explanation of this. Chopping. So you're supposed to go to this guy and tell him, stop chopping the wood in order to allow the death to occur. Right? Another example there, I must say, is if a person has, this, I'm just telling you his cases, I'm not giving you any explanation for it, if a person has salt on his tongue, and by having salt on his tongue, that does not allow his soul to leave his body, you should take the salt from his tongue, thereby allowing his soul to leave his body, right? And the must says in that same piece, says, you're not allowed to actively go ahead and kill him. This is not actively killing him. This is removing an impediment to his death, right? So now, this requires, you know, yet to figure out exactly what does it mean. This is important. So there are certain rabbis, this is a, a minority opinion, but there are certain rabbis that say if you have a person who is basically dead, he's only artificially being kept alive by a respirator. So that respirator, in a certain sense, is just an impediment to his death. The guy, the guy would be dead right now. I'm not talking about a guy who's, who would suffer, and, and a guy who's being artificially preserved right now. Right? So that's, that's considered impeding his death. Now, many disagree with that. <coughs> but there is an opinion based on this that that, that that would be considered an impediment to death. Now that's talking about a person who is dying. But let's say a person like Brittany Maynard, right? Let's say a person who, like, like Brittany Maynard who is terminal, right? She was, had a life expectancy of six months. She's not dying. She has a decent amount of life ahead of her. But she's terminal, which in Jewish law would be considered... I would call a few months a decent amount. I mean, it, she's, not in the, she's not in the process of death. Okay. She's not in that. She has life left. She's not dying, not an act of dying. So a terminal patient in Jewish law is generally considered assumed through appropriate doctor decision to live less than 12 months. 
That's considered terminal. There's a, there's a differentiation between a chaye shah, it's called in the Gemara, a temporary life, which is less than 12 months, and a chaye a permanent life. Obviously, all life is terminal. But uh, permanent life, which means you last more than a year. So in terms of, in terms of um, terminal patients, are we allowed to now apply this law, which we discovered, of removing an impediment to death, even by a terminal patient? Or is that law only found by a ghost who's literally on the brink of death and dying, we can allow the death to happen quicker? So... This is a huge debate, which you could research. I can give you like thousands of articles on Jewish articles on the topic. I'm just going to present to you one view of Rabbi Moshe Feinstein, which is a, definitely a well-accepted view. Again, probably different people, you'll ask and say different things. Rabbi Moshe Feinstein basically said that there is three conditions which will allow you to not treat, and in certain situations obligate you to not treat, not just allow you to not treat, obligate you to not treat a terminal patient, thereby allowing them to die. And what are his three, his three rules? His three rules are, first of all, they have to be terminal, which I say is obvious, but that's an example. The first case of Dr. Kevorkian was this woman by the name of Janet Hopkins. She just discovered she came down with Alzheimer's. She had a life expectancy of 10 years. That's she, a long time. That's a nice amount of life. And she knew that the 10 years, she didn't start forgetting in this, and she couldn't play tennis with the son anymore. She was, getting, she was getting so scared of the future that she killed herself literally 10 years before doctors thought she would die. So that's not a terminal patient in Jewish law. Right? Even though we granted... And that's true suicide. That's suicide. I mean, right. So, in, in that situation, that is absolutely will never be allowed for anyone to even not treat a patient like that. You're obligated to treat a patient and extend their life no matter what the situation is. That's rule number one. Rule number two is the patient is suffering and the suffering is uncontrollable. It's not just a little bit of pain, it's uncontrollable pain. And now let's just explain this for a second just to get back to what... Dr. Zeus was saying before. In, in Judaism, pain is very real. The Torah is very concerned with the quality of life, and there should really never be a situation of um, uncontrollable pain. And let's say, for example, this is what I was told, this is from what I've, I've read and I've, and I've uh, heard, you can tell me if medical school taught you differently, that um, in terms of when you're making a decision in, let's say, giving morphine to a patient who's in a lot of pain, now everyone knows mor- morphine can cause a, you know, respiratory failure, if you give too much. So now, if you give too much, you can kill the person. If you give too little, then you're not going to be properly treating the pain. So there's a certain threshold that obviously requires an expert in the field to know how to properly give it. But if you have a certain room of error, do we, is it our job to make sure that the patient has no pain, even though it requires a lethal risk because it'll be slightly more? Or is it our job to make sure we don't kill the patient, even if it'll then require, result in the patient having somewhat more pain? So... For what I've read and seen is the general teaching in medical school, at least of palliative care, is that you should err on the side of life. And that you should and, and therefore you should not take any risk to life and you should always lower the lower the amount of morphine to ensure that the person stays alive. But you said palliative care is the other way. Because remember we went to the lecture. Yeah. yeah. What about that? The lecture was very much the opposite. Yeah, 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 yeah. yeah, 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 yeah because like that was the uh, pain I, I, is what fine. the patient I, there are definitely are people, people, people that say that. I, I agree. I'm just saying. I, I mean, I what, 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 what were they? Well, I don't know. If you guys for, took for, this out. What did they teach in medical school? For, for my medical school. More morphine. Yeah, 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 yeah. For my Even medical school. That was yeah. a famous case. A famous, a famous article yeah. in the New England Journal of Medicine of Timothy Quill. It's like right after Tom, at the Watson. He talks about this patient who was going to die, and then what was the story there exactly that he decided to, to basically overdose, he overdosed on morphine after they. It was different than Kevorkian because it was a patient he'd been dealing with for three, four years, and she agreed that life got too hard and he killed her. What? Wait, let me just, let me just, but, let me just interrupt. If a person is at the end of life, and, and there's a transition from, from the care that they're able to give, so let's say they're on a, a ventilator, or let's say they're yeah. on a, or they're very sick, there is a certain process that goes into place to, to hasten death. There's a morphine drip, there's a hospice, there's a lot of things that happen right. once you go into that 100%. withdrawal of care. Right. So, so, so it does be that. So, so wait, that's the thing. No, 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 there, no you're, never, there, yeah. you're never allowed to actively do something that will kill a patient, right? Which means you can never give, you can never give a, a morphine drip that you know this drip will kill the patient. Exactly. You can never do that. But you, you cannot treat him. You cannot treat a patient. If a patient is dying of cancer, you can not, you're not obligated to put him through chemotherapy because maybe it'll prolong his life two months or even a month if that chemotherapy will produce a tremendously painful life that will not be treatable. Right? Well, we have to understand also the maker's form is if they're still in a sound state of mind like, and they elect to do chemotherapy or not, then you're going to have a consent issue. That, that's different. We're talking when we reach the point where they can't. Yeah, where they can't. What, what, what I learned in med school, I mean, I don't treat patients now. 
But what they really <laughs> hammered to us in that is that uh, I know it, it, it's that uh, it's especially for my generation that came out. They said that it was a mistake that people did not treat pain more aggressively in the earlier so, days, especially so, for cancer. So they said for us to more aggressively treat pain. In Jewish law, the law is that this is a, I think. My name is not all post I don't know, that people argue. We're, we're supposed to err on the side of pain. We're treating, and we treat the pain yeah. even if it comes with a lethal risk. And now let's just understand that for a second. Everyone agrees. You're not supposed to err on the side of saving the life. No. You're, no, we'll get that in a second. You're, you're supposed to err. We're, we're not talking about saving life. Talking if you can, you're never allowed to kill a patient. Well, what, let me just, let's just clarify this. Let's break it down for one second. If you, if you have a, a, a risky surgery, let's say, that if you, this surgery is successful, you have a chance of extending life five years, right? But the person right now has life expectancy of six months, and the surgeon might kill him on the table. So either you'll extend his life five years, or you'll come on the table. Everybody agrees that you definitely should do the surgery. If the, if the patient refuses, fine, that's another story. But definitely, primarily what you should try to do is you should do the surgery, because the potential to extend life significantly outweighs the risk of shortening life. Now here is a significantly different situation. Here, we're talking about, does pain, you're not extending this guy's life at all. Does the fact that he's in pain justify the risk of shortening his life? Right? This is a much... The, the gain is much smaller here. However, even here, under a certain situation, we'll discuss the two, the two uh, stipulations in a second. But under two stipulations, the rule is that you are supposed to err on the side of pain, and you should make sure that the pain, because pain is not merely innocuous in Jewish law. Pain is not just a symptom. Pain is real. Pain is part of the disease itself. And therefore, you're obligated to treat that pain. Now, this is with two conditions. One condition is, is that you're, never, you're always trying to treat the pain and never trying to kill the patient. And right. you know you won't kill the patient. Right. However, in terms, of, in terms of the gray area, if you're focused on, kill, on, on, training the pain, on treating the pain, and you don't believe what you're doing right now will kill the patient, even though it's a risk it will, you're allowed to take that lethal risk to treat the pain. Even erring on the side of pain, and if the patient dies, that's fine. Again, obviously, you're not trying to kill the patient. And the second stipulation is, is you, have to try to see, you have to seek out the most um, experienced person to do to make such a decision and you can't leave that up to you know like a junior resident to try to make that decision of erring on the side of pain you have to you, right? you have to <laughs> so in jewish law it's not supposed to be right so those are the those are the are the, are the two two things so basically what comes out is and back to what we're saying to to not treat a patient you have to be terminal he has to be suffering uncontrollably to the extent that you can't treat his pain anymore and the patient has to not want to live anymore, has to request not wanting to be treated because of that pain. With those three situations, says by Feinstein, you're forbidden to do a surgery on him that will extend his life because you don't have the right to extend his life of pain given those situations. And you're obligated to not treat him, actually. That's how he, however, he says, when we say not treating, not treating means not providing additional medical treatments to him. However, you are obligated to provide him with the basic necessities of life, which is food, water, and oxygen. Blood transfusion, blood and antibiotics is already disputable whether or not that's on the side of treatment or on the side of necessities of life. We can argument? debate that. But that, that's, all, that's, all on, that's already also. It's on the argument of is that considered regular food and oxygen or is that considered treatment? That's debatable. But definitely in terms of the basics, you, you have to always provide them with, um, with those things. And that's really the, the basic sum up of the laws here. And just the last step here. So let's say you're in a situation like a person who wants to commit suicide, their life is too painful, they don't want to deal with it. What is the Jewish law regarding assisting someone in this situation? So there's going to be two, potentially two biblical prohibitions and one rabbinic prohibition. There's a biblical, we learned this, this is like, comes by every class, there's a prohibition, this is one of the sources of the obligation of doctors, Los Amor Adam Reyecha, right? Don't stand by idly as your brother's blood spills. So by you providing a patient with um, a lethal, a lethal, right, a lethal uh, pills to kill themselves, you're obviously not fulfilling your obligation of not standing by idly as your brother's blood spills. That's definitely the first one you're going to have a problem with. The second one is, there's a, there's a, there's a prohibition of the even less than before a blind person don't place a stumbling block, which the Gemara explains is not literally referring to placing a stumbling block in front of a blind person. It's referring to helping somebody do something they're not allowed to be doing and assisting them in it. Now, in this law, it's only prohibited biblically if they can't get it otherwise. If you're assisting them in a situation that they could not do it without your help, that's when you're going to be over the biblical prohibition. Right? I mean, if they can go to a different doctor and the other doctor give it to them, by you giving that to them, you're not violating the biblical law of assisting them. However, the rabbis made a rabbinical law still that forbade in any situation to assist someone in doing prohibition. So it's going to either come up with two biblical laws or with a biblical and a rabbinical law. Either one's definitely not allowed to 
assisted suicide um, in Torah law. And there's a explicit verse. If you look in, we say it in Hallel. One of the praises that King da- that uh, King David writes in Psalms, at the end of Hallel is Yasser Yisraeli Ka. King David praises God. He says, Yisraelika, the God afflicted me and pained me tremendously. But he didn't give me over to death. I mean, he's praising God that despite the fact that he was given all of his difficulties and all of his pains and all of his suffering, the mere fact that he was alive was worthwhile of praising God. I mean, that's definitely a, the basic default Jewish tradition. You were to die. Thank you for listening to the Thinking Jew podcast and for taking the time to study Torah and deepen your connection to Judaism. If you found value in today's episode, please leave us a rating or review and subscribe to the podcast. If you have any questions, comments, or topic requests for Rabbi Moshe, please email the Thinking Jew podcast at gmail.com or visit thethinkingjew.com.